courage to do the right thing. Mr. Speaker, I beg you, tell me, am I wrong? The Honorable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, he is wrong. That's the simple answer, Mr. Speaker. There's uh, some uh, uh, problems with memory, Mr. Speaker. We have an agreement with uh, NDP colleagues. The Conservatives were opposed. We know that the best way to ensure stability in the country, to ensure affordability, is to have more competition. There's more choice with more competition. There's better prices, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to fight every day to ensure the quality of life of Canadians. The Honourable Member from Victoria. Mr. Speaker, while well, Canadians are struggling and food bank use is at an all-time high, rich oil and gas CEOs are making record profits. Yep. Canadians are frustrated. But sources say that the finance minister backed out from an excess profits tax in this budget. Why? Because oil and gas lobbyists asked her to. Yeah. Just like the Conservatives, the Liberals keep caving to big oil and gas. Why do the Liberals keep protecting the profits of big oil and gas instead of everyday Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would point out Canada is the first and the only G20 country to have eliminated inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. We have introduced a tax on share buybacks across the economy to tackle exactly excess profits. Canada is putting into place the first and only in the world oil and gas emissions cap to hold the industry accountable for their own commitments. On the other hand, the Conservative leader has pledged to his oil and gas CEO donors to make pollution free again. We know who's in the pockets of oil and gas. It's that party over there. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. For eight years of this Liberal NDP Prime Minister, Canadians know that he's not worth the cost. Even proud Liberal and former Bank Governor David Dodge, who worked for Paul Martin and Jean Chrétien, says that this budget is on track to be the worst one since 1982. Wow. Canadians know that this budget will bring higher taxes, higher spending, meaning even more misery for families who can't afford to eat. Instead of drowning everyone, will they fix the budget, axe the tax on farmers and food, and stop the endless spending with the dollar-for-dollar dollar law so that Canadians can afford to live. Yes. The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if the Honourable Member is aware, but our fiscal markers are very strong. That is a AAA credit rating by an independent objective observer. That is the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. All the while, while we will continue to support vulnerable Canadians, something that they to do on the other side of the House by voting against $10 a day childcare, families and seniors every single time. Mr. Speaker, the hypocrisy is palpable. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure that the Honourable Member is aware of the pain that Canadians right. feel who can't right. afford to live in Canada. And what's worse is that they can't even afford to die. The Prime Minister's own news agency, the CBC, is reporting in provinces across Canada, dead bodies are being stored in mobile freezers because people can't afford the cost of laying their loved ones to rest. They can't afford their homes, they can't afford their groceries, they can't afford their gas, and now they can't afford a dignified goodbye. We're asking asking him just to stop. We know he won't. So how much inflationary fuel is the PM going to pour on the fire at 4 o'clock today? Here, here. The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians deserve to die with dignity. They also deserve supports while they are alive, which is why we have reduced poverty by 22 percent on this side of the House, which is why we have supported families with $10 a day child care and the Canada Child Benefit, which has lifted 500,000 children out of poverty, Mr. Speaker. What we will do on this side of the House is maintain a strong fiscal position while supporting Canadians, especially vulnerable. Honourable Canadians, Mr. Speaker, we take that as our priority, unlike the other side of the House. The Honourable Member from Central Okanagan, Samilkameen, Nicola. 
Mr. Speaker, after eight years, we know that this Prime Minister and his NDP Liberal government are not worth the cost. His recent spending spree is a inflationary and making everything worse, adding billions to the debt. This year alone, they will throw $52 billion towards debt servicing. That's more than they allocate to the provinces for health care. Doesn't the Prime Minister see his reckless spending as increasing inflation and debt, burdening all generations of already struggling Canadians? Or is he too busy cutting checks to care? Yeah. Okay, Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's delve into the numbers a little bit. When the leader of the Conservatives was Minister of Jobs, unemployment in Canada was 11 per cent higher. Wages in this country were 75 per cent of what they are now, and they had our foreign direct investment behind in Ireland, behind Japan, and now, Mr. Speaker, we are th third in the world, and when you divide it by our population, we're first in the world on bringing good jobs, on bringing investments, on making Canada place where everybody wants to call home, unlike the Conservatives, which are full of bluff and bluster. The Honourable Member from Central Okanagan, Similkami Nicola. Spendy ways, my friends, spendy ways. David Dodge said that this was likely to be the worst budget since 1982. 1982? Who was Prime Minister then? How out of control was that budget? How broke did Canada and Canadians become before Pierre Elliott Trudeau finally took his walk in the snow? Plus ça change, Mr. The more things change. Two million visits to food banks in a single month. Isn't it clear that Canadians are desperately hungry for change? How many more Canadians need to visit food banks before the Prime Minister really realizes that today's budget is a recipe for disaster? Yeah. 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 Minister for Employment and Workforce Development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today sounds like a day for some of the greatest hits, so let's put the Conservatives in the spotlight. Mr. Speaker, when we formed government in 2015, one of the first things we did is we asked the wealthiest 1% of Canadians to pay more. How did the Conservatives vote? Against. When we asked to make sure that Canadians and their children could have money coming to their houses every month, how did the Conservatives vote? Against. And now that we're going to have a national school food program and housing across this country, and investments to grow this country, how are the Conservatives going to vote against? Order, please. I'm convinced that all members would like to hear the question by the Honourable Member for Charlebeau, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, in order to bring inflation down and allow the Bank of Canada to lower interest rates, there aren't 36 solutions. You have to cap spending by applying the dollar for dollar rule. Want to spend a dollar? Save a dollar somewhere else. It's simple. It's how everybody manages their budget at home. And that's how all government ministers should manage their departments. Is the Prime Minister going to cap spending to keep inflation and interest rates down in his budget that he's going to table shortly? The Honourable Minister of Public uh, Services, Public Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Conservatives have always wanted to do and voted in favours to reduce taxes for the wealthiest and make lives more difficult for everyone else, uh, the middle class and those lower income earners. This includes the Canada Child Benefit. They voted against it in 2016. It was one of their first votes. It includes a vote against uh, dental care for seniors. Uh, the six hundred thousand seniors who are now eligible for this uh, plan. He, the leader of the Conservative Party, flees when we ask him questions. When he's asked questions about this, the honourable member for Charlebourg Haute Saint Charles, Mr. Speaker, uh, Conservative Party has three simple demands today. It's to build housing, not bureaucracy. The government insists on announcing inflationary measures that could cost Canadian taxpayers billions of dollars and only serves to increase inflation and the cost of living. Even David Dodge, the former Liberal governor of the Bank of Canada, has predicted that this will be the worst budget since 1982. Will the Prime Minister commit to following the demands of the leader of the official opposition and build housing, not bureaucracy? The Honourable Minister of Public Procurement, uh, my esteemed colleague is uh, putting the leader of the opposition and housing together. He built six affordable housing units when he was Minister of housing. So that's all he built during his mandate when he was the minister responsible for housing for the entire country. In my colleague's own writing, if I 
can say there's only 12 affordable housing units that were built. Uh, so that's uh, more than uh, twice what the Conservative leader built. The Honourable Member for Drummond, uh, the English Montreal School Board has decided to challenge Bill 21 before the Supreme Court. That's fine. It's their right. But for the federal government to get directly involved in this case against the will of the National Assembly and provide money, our money, and lawyers, that's a no-no. The Quebec lieutenant says that Canada is secular, that the government supports secularism, but keeps telling us that we have to defend religious freedom against Bill 21. When will the Liberals understand that the best way to protect religion is for the state to have none at all? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would repeat a fact that my colleague knows full well, is that we're working with this. The Bloc Québécois, when they want to talk about Quebec issues, we are Quebecers and they tell us to mind our own business. A foreign leader came here and then someone tells them what to do and that person must be listened to. I must tell my colleague there are 30 five Quebec MPs elected by Quebecers were proud Quebecers and will always stand up for Quebec. The Honourable Member for Drummond, uh, Mr. Speaker, by supporting the will of the National Assembly, they can do good. By supporting the challenge to the law and the secular nature of the state, Ottawa is challenging our model of living together in Quebec. We don't want religion and the state to intermingle. We've moved on. I'm sure that this isn't easy for our MPs to, who fight to ensure that the days of the House begin with a prayer, but Quebecers have chosen secularism. Religion is private. The state is public. I'd like the minister to answer frankly, why is his government opposed to secularism? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to be clear, it's a group of Quebecers who went to court to defend their rights under Quebec's Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. They went to uh, the Court of Appeal, and they've talked about it a few times for the past year. We'll be here to take part in the discussions. They're very important, and they consider they are in relation to the Charter, the Canadian Charter and the Quebec Charter. The Honourable Member for Drummond, Mr. Speaker, this is a parliament where we hear God save the King for the head of the Anglican Church in a parliament where elective representatives pray every day, not at home, which would be their strictest right. But here in this House, we have a government that wants to change the election date for Diwali, a religious holiday, and they're going to tell us that Canada supports secularism that is so important. Honestly, will the minister admit that if he wants to challenge Bill 21, it's simply because he's against secularism? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Mr. Speaker, we are firmly committed to taking part in these important discussions that have uh, huge repercussions for all Canadians. These are questions that concern the Canadian Charter and the Quebec Charter, as we have indicated on a number of occasions. We have serious concerns with regard to the preventive use of the uh, notwithstanding clause of Section 33 of the Charter. So we need to ensure this. Thank you. Well, member from Lampton, Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. But let's hear from some rural residents. Judy from Arcona writes, the carbon tax is killing us. And Scott from Tupperville says, as a senior, I'm finding it hard to cope. And Walter from Elvinson writes, I have not even received a carbon rebate. So in his broken promise budget being set to be delivered at 4 p.m. today, will the Prime Minister finally axe the tax on farmers, make food cheaper for Canadians, and pass Bill C-234 in its original form? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd really like to ask the Conservatives, they don't have to wait till 4 o'clock, they could pass the fall economic statement. Because, Mr. Speaker, that is having an impediment on what rural top-up is going. So in my riding, that would mean $1,430 to go every year to a family of four. All across the country, in Alberta, it would mean $2,160. I wish they'd pass the Fez, then they would truly be helping rural Canadians and rural families. Here, here. 
member from Lambton Kent Middlesex. Well, Mr. Speaker, even the polls tell us that the majority of Canadians are fed up with this Prime Minister overspending, over promising, under delivering, and failing this country. Over 52 billion will be spent, to spent on servicing his debt alone. And while Canadians are struggling, he raised the price of gas, groceries, and home heating of carbon tax by 23 percent just two weeks ago. This is punishment, not progress. So in his big deficit budget later today, will the Prime Minister finally axe the tax on farmers and make food cheaper for Canadians? The Honourable Minister for Rural Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, I want to tell this story again. I told it a few weeks ago. It was a constituent in my riding who took the time to track every single amount of money that he'd paid. And you know what? He doubled it in case he missed a few things. He was in $38 every time he got his check. I wish they'd do their homework, Mr. Speaker, because 8 out of 10 Canadians do get more with their Canada carbon rebate, especially in rural Canada. The Honourable Member from Regina Leuven. This coming from the Liberal member who said if Canadians want programs, they should vote Liberal. Come on, Mr. Speaker. After eight long years, this Liberal NDP government is not worth the cost. Canadians are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. And we all know that at four o'clock today, they're going to table a dumpster fire budget. This Prime Minister simply is not worth the cost. The question is, will he finally axe a tax on farmers so Canadians can put food on their table. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we are focused on ensuring affordability for Canadians moving forward and addressing the climate issue. The price on pollution is an affordability mechanism. Eight out of ten families get more money back. The PBO has underlined that. 300 economists across this country have underlined that. Mr. Speaker, every one of those MPs over there ran on the platform that included a price on pollution. They, they had, this is the height of hypocrisy. And my goodness, their plan is only to, to take money away from poor people and to let the planet burn. The Honourable Member from Regina Leuven. Climate can can say whatever he wants, but they are 62nd out of 67 countries. The Honourable uh, Member is an experienced member in this House and understands that we cannot uh, refer to other members other than their titles that they have. O order! Order! So the Honourable Member understands that, and I'd ask the Honourable Member to start from, start from the top and to avoid such language. He's not Ken. Ken's handsome. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. They see it time and time again when they go to the grocery store. And we know that our farmers are paying more. By 2030, when this carbon tax is fully implemented at $170 a ton, farmers will be paying $1 billion in taxes. So my question was again, on their 4 o'clock budget dumpster fire, will they ask the tax of farmers so Canadians can put food on the table? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure if the Honourable Member is actually trying to insult me or actually give me a compliment. But, <laughs> uh, but, but I would say that it's important in this chamber that we actually use facts, that we are not misleading Canadians. Eight out of ten Canadians get more money back. That is underlined by 300 economists in this, uh, in this country. And to be honest, it's underlined by the Premier of his province. The, when Scott Moe came here and actually testified, what he said is they looked at all alternatives and they were all too expensive. Well, that's absolutely the right thing, because we have put in place something that actually does address affordability, reduces carbon emissions. On that side of the House, they don't believe in climate change, and they act... Honourable Member from Hamilton Centre. 
This past weekend, I met with over 100 youth from Hamilton who told me they don't even know how they're gonna be able to pay rent, let alone ever be able to afford to buy a home in their lifetime. And a recent Spectator News report confirms that Hamilton's rent is out of control and quickly outpacing Canadian cities. And under the Liberals' watch, life has only gotten better for wealthy developers. And they're raking it in. The Honourable uh, Member from Hamilton Centre, usually I can hear quite well. I'm having difficulty hearing him today. I'm going to ask all Honourable Members, in particular the Member from Prince George Peace River, Northern Rockies, please to uh, only take the microphone when he's or take the floor when he's recognized by the Speaker. I'm going to ask the Honourable, uh, give the Honourable Member 20 seconds to finish uh, his question. The Honourable Member. Under the Liberals' watch, life has only gotten better for big money developers, and they're raking it in while the rents double for Canadians. So, why are the Liberals refusing to take on corporate developers and failing to build non market affordable housing now? Yeah. Order. The Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Minister, rather, for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have great respect for the Honourable Member and thank him for his advocacy to build more homes in Hamilton. But he may not be aware that we recently invested $93.5 million in his city to help speed up the construction of up to 9,000 new homes. Mr. Speaker, in addition, we are putting money on the table that's going to help speed up the development. But if his concern is about building non market housing, I'm pleased to point to the billion dollars we invested in the fall economic statement to build more affordable housing. The hundreds of millions we're building, using to build more cooperative housing. The $4 billion we're using to deal with the needs of urban, rural and northern uh, communities to serve Indigenous peoples. We're going to build housing for the most vulnerable. We're going to build housing for everyone. The Honourable Member from Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, Indigenous people in Winnipeg make up nearly 75 per cent of the unhoused population. Almost 90 per cent are sleeping outdoors or living in encampments. The Liberals' inadequate response is costing lives. And the Conservative leader, he cut 8,000 affordable units when he was the minister in charge. Clearly not a Conservative priority. In today's budget, will the Liberals commit to increasing funding for affordable housing with rent geared to income and get serious about ending homelessness? The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her concern, and she's right to point out the desperate need of so many communities across country when it comes to building more affordable housing. She's right to point out the need for increased investment to support the needs of Indigenous people who remain unhoused. That's why we put more than $4 billion on the table to support the needs of Indigenous peoples in community, and an additional $4.3 billion to deal with the needs of Indigenous peoples who live in urban, rural, and northern environments. On top of that, Mr. Speaker, we've invested more than $120 million to build thousands of homes in her city. We're going to keep doing what we need to build more affordable housing. And one point of correction, it was 800,000 units that the opposition leader lost while he was housing minister. The Honourable Member from Fleetwood, Port Kells. Mr. Speaker, today the Deputy Prime Minister will deliver the budget. Yeah, yeah. Over the last few weeks, we've seen the important efforts of this government to invest in this country, building a record we could be proud of. On the other side, Leader of the Opposition loves to talk about his record when he was Minister of Employment. He wants to convince Canadians that he has the solution to make life better. Cut, cut, cut. Well, cuts don't create jobs, cuts don't create investment, cuts don't increase wages. Can the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Official Languages tell the House what this government is going to do to make life better for Canadians? Here, here, great question. The Honourable Member, the Honourable Minister for Employment and Workforce Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague from Fleetwood Port, Kells, for his hard work. Since we took office in 2015, Mr. Speaker, wages are up, employment is up, and foreign direct investment is up. We are investing in Canadians, in the economy, creating great jobs and growth for the whole country. When the leader of the opposition was Minister of Employment, wages were lower, employment was lower, foreign investment was lower. lower. While we're fighting for fairness for every generation, his record is clear, and there's one one thing that'll be up if he ever takes over cuts, cuts, and more cuts. The Honourable Member from King Vaughan. 
Mr. Speaker, after eight years, it's clear this NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. In Newfoundland and Labrador, there are 28 bodies in a freezer outside of a hospital because their families can't afford to bury them. This sounds like a Netflix horror movie, but sadly, it is the nightmare of this Prime Minister's out-of-control spending. Conservatives demand him to stop. Stop the outrageous spending and make life affordable. Will they listen and give Canadians the ability to bury their loved ones? The Honourable Minister for Rural Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, we know it's a challenging time for many, many people. That's why we've been there all along, Mr. Speaker. We've been there with the child care benefit. We've been there with the increased OIS and GIS. We're now there with a dental program that's rolling out to help people. We know we have our carbon rebate this year for people. We know it's challenging times. We'll be there for Canadians, and we always will be, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from King Vaughan. The old song is, stop in the name of Canadians! 28 bodies in a freezer because families can't afford to bury their loved ones. Houses have doubled. Food bank usage is higher in history. Well, you know. Families are losing their homes. Enough. Today the Liberals are announcing their budget. Will they show some compassion and ensure there's a dollar of savings for every dollar of spending so Canadians can afford to live? Before the Honourable Minister gets up, I'm going to encourage uh, members, please, I, I hear some singing in the House. You know that singing is not permitted in the House. I'll just ask them to please, whoever is doing that, to please stop. The Honourable uh, Minister for Rural Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, when people find it very challenging and very upsetting time in their life, they know that this party on this side of the House is there to help them for all many, in many, many reasons. And Mr. Speaker, we don't believe in slogans. We believe in helping people, which we have been since the very, very beginning, and we will continue to, especially with today's budget later today. Thank you. Then I have the the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this Liberal government is just not worth the cost. We've had eight years of skyrocketing deficits and debt. And this government has never controlled its spending. It's the perfect storm that generates inflation. And what's the result of that? Rent has doubled. Mortgages have doubled. It's now cheaper for people to live in motels than in an apartment. At a bare minimum, during the budget later, will this government present a plan to control spending? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Six, Mr. Speaker. Six is the number of affordable housing units that the leader of the Conservative Party had built when he was Minister of Housing for the entire country during his entire term. Quebec municipalities are building 8,000 housing units with the help of the federal government. If you divide that by six, it's about 1,200 times more. And yet, the leader of the Conservative Party is insulting Quebec municipalities. He's calling them incompetent. Who's really incompetent here? The Conservative leader with his six housing units or Quebec municipalities with 8,000? The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, this member from Quebec seems to have fun with numbers these days. Well, I have a number for him. 750 arrive can cost 750 times more. And who was president of the Treasury Board at that time? The member across the way. And then after that, he was Minister of Health. And now he's Minister of Procurement. So it's a real hat trick of incompetence. Does he think... It's insulting to have spent 750 times more when it was his responsibility to ensure that things were done right. The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Insulting is indeed the key word here. Insulting Quebec municipalities by calling them incompetent. They are building 8,000 affordable housing units with the federal and Quebec governments. Meanwhile, the insulting leader of the Conservative Party only managed to build six housing units, affordable housing units, throughout his entire term, throughout the entire country. There have been 66 in my colleague for Louis Saint Laurent's riding alone. 
The Honorable Member for saint saint bagot Mr. Speaker, Ottawa is getting involved in a new border fiasco. On May 13th, importers may hit a wall at the border at Customs. Why? Because there will be a new application at the border called CARM for paying import duties. Last week, 19 organizations raised concerns that neither the CPSA nor businesses will be ready on time. Will Ottawa delay the implementation of this application until the, the Committee on International Trade finishes its study of the matter and comes up with recommendations? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows very well, we always work with Com committees, we always collaborate with them, and I myself have led, have met with the leader of the CPSA. We met yesterday on this matter. I have full confidence in the agency, which is fully aware of the circumstances surrounding this application, and I have full confidence that it will be handled correctly. The Honourable Member. Well, it's all very well to talk about full trust, but there's a precedent here for Ottawa's failures on big IT systems. We all know Phoenix. Eight years later, the federal government still can't pay its employees' property. And there's another precedent with CBSA, Arrive Can. Wow, how reassuring. So coming back to this CARM system, the agency did not provide the documents requested by the committee. So the committee cannot finish up its study and no one seems to know what to do if the application crashes on May 13th. Will Ottawa do what it has to do, which is delay the start date? The Honourable Minister, once again, Mr. Speaker, we have consulted and we will continue to consult exporters, importers, we understand their concerns. That is why I raised the question with the head of the CBSA, and I do not share the pessimism of my colleague from the Bloc. As my colleague, the Quebec Lieutenant, often says, they are experts on pessimism in the Bloc. I don't share that, and I think we will act correctly on this file. Member from Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. After eight years of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister, it's clear he isn't worth the cost or the corruption, like his $60 million arrive scam contractor who's being hauled before the House of Commons tomorrow for refusing to answer committee questions about his role in this Prime Minister's latest multi million dollar scandal. Now, this contractor claims that he only did Google searches and sent LinkedIn direct messages. So, what did this guy and his partner give to these Liberals in exchange? for the multi-million dollars that they were paid. The Honourable Minister for Public Security. Mr. Speaker, just because my honourable friend continues to repeat something that he knows is not accurate doesn't make it so. He knows very well, Mr. Speaker, that there are a series of investigations that are being undertaken. The RCMP are seized with this matter. If the House, in its wisdom, decides to call people before the bar. That's entirely within the purview of the House. And, Mr. Speaker, we've also said from the beginning that anybody who abused taxpayers' money should face the consequences, and that's exactly what will happen. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. The Minister gets up and says that something's not true. Well, point to the lie is what I would say to him, because we know that 75% of the contractors listed on this app did no actual work. We know that two guys working out of a basement were paid tens of millions of dollars but did no actual work. And we know that every step of the way, these Liberals have tried to cover it up like that Minister and everyone on the front bench and the right to the back voted against having the Auditor General investigate. The question is very simple. These yo-yos working out of a basement were paid tens of millions of dollars, did no actual work. What did they give these Liberals in exchange for that sweetheart deal? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Again, uh, Mr. Speaker, if our Honourable Friend wants me to point out the part of his question which he knows isn't accurate, it's the last sentence of the question. The Honourable Member for Mégantique l'Érable. While speaking of this scandal, the Arrive Can scandal has reached unheard of levels in 100 years of Canadian history. 
tomorrow, Christian Firth will appear at the bar of the House of Commons right here for protecting his friends within the Liberal government by refusing to give their names and lying. Just think about it. Two guys working out of a basement with no specialized IT knowledge. They got $20 million for developing a digital application. Arrive, can. I would ask the minister responsible for these historic levels of corruption. I would ask him to get up and apologize for this scandal, which made his liberal friends rich on the backs of Canadians. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, my colleague knows very well that there is an investigation underway. The House is bringing in someone to appear on this matter. That is completely appropriate within the responsibilities of the House of Commons. We accept that. And from the beginning, whether with the Auditor General, whether with the RCMP, whether with parliamentary committees, we have always accepted an in-depth review of this situation. And anyone who has taken advantage of taxpayer funds will pay the appropriate consequence. The Honourable Member for chateau de la -Colle. Mr. Speaker, National Tourism Week celebrates a vital industry in Canada. It represents one out of ten jobs and affects all regions, like mine, chateau de la -Colle, which will soon be called chateau de la jardins de Napierville. Our government is making strategic investments, like the Indigenous Tourism Fund and the Tourism Growth Program. It's exactly the opposite of what the Conservatives would do. They always vote to cut these programs. Can the Minister of Tourism tell us about the importance of the tourism industry? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my colleague for chateau de la -Colle said so eloquently, this industry generated almost $100 billion in 2023 and employs 2 million people throughout the country. Beyond the numbers, tourism is something we can be proud of. We can be proud of sharing places with 2.5 million visitors from throughout the world. And that is why I am very surprised that the Conservative Party voted against giving a job to the Bonhomme Carnaval. That's why on this side of the House, we will all be wishing Canadians happy Tourism Week. It's, it's rare that I hear the Honourable Member's voice carry so far. I'm going to ask him to please to make sure that he doesn't speak until he's recognized by the chair. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. After eight years, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Just when you think this NDP Liberal government couldn't be more out of touch, they go ahead and nominate the CBSA as unsung heroes for the Arrive scam, recklessly spending $60 million taxpayer dollars and demonstrating some of the worst financial record-keeping we've ever seen is the opposite of innovative and effective procurement practices. The CBSA should be an example of how not to do government procurement. Why on earth would this government reward incompetence? Wow. Wow. Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend knows very well that we have instituted a series of changes in terms of the procurement process, both at CBSA and horizontally across the Government of Canada. My colleague, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, has spoken about the changes we've made in light of the recommendations, of course, of the Auditor General. We welcome other reviews, whether it's parliamentary committees. And in the case of Arrive Can, Mr. Speaker, as you know, the RCMP are looking into this matter. And as I said, anybody who abused taxpayers' money will properly face the consequences. Absolutely. The Honourable Member from Cumberland, Colchester. Yeah. Speaker, the costly NDP Liberal Coalition have announced another poorly conceived federal idea. Their dental care debacle is failing Canadians. I have one simple question. How many dentists in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI have signed up for the dental care debacle. No question. The Honourable Minister of Health. Well, it's great news, Mr. Speaker, because unlike the member opposite, we're working with dental providers and we're opening up a new portal, which means that in order to participate, all they have to do is accept that dental card and provide service. And the dentists that I'm talking to as we work through these issues of the negotiation are extremely excited to do what the member is not, which is to make sure that every Canadian from coast to coast to coast gets oral health care. And that means 1.8 million seniors and soon 9 million Canadians who will have the oral health care that they need. 
I ask the honourable member from Oxford, please, to uh, allow his colleague to ask a question. I'll allow the minister to answer. The honourable member from Cumberland Colchester. Well, interesting enough, the, the Minister of Health of the NDP Liberal Government has been singing the praises and photo ops of this program for months now. Their plan is lacking and it's failing Canadians. One simple question once again to the Minister. How many dentists in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI have signed up for the botched care announcement? I'll actually give him the answer. It's eight out of 1,107. Wow. Wow. Minister of Health. Well, of course, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that we're opening a new portal and that members don't have to sign up, that all that needs to happen is they bring their card and they participate in the program. But here's the truth, Mr. Speaker. I'll ask honourable members to please restrain themselves. I know it's budget day, it's a big day. Uh, the Honourable Minister has 20 seconds left on the clock. Well, Mr. Speaker, the truth is that they don't want that 9 million Canadians who don't have dental care to get service. They don't want or believe that Canadians who don't have access to diabetes medication to get it. They don't want, uh, Mr. Speaker, for women to be able to get access to universal contraception. So they push despair because they don't want people to hope for something better. Well, we're there to deliver something better. The Honourable Member for Richmond Centre. Mr. Speaker, climate change is real. The science is clear. Current drought conditions and above average temperatures are bringing an increasing risk of wildfires. Last year, more than 230,000 Canadians were forced out of their homes not knowing what the future looks. Now, next to 100 fires are already burning in British Columbia and communities are rightfully concerned. Can the Minister of Emergency Preparedness tell us what our federal government has been doing to... Informally, informally, I did ask the Honourable Member from Mishimaski, Fraser Valley, please to uh, allow the uh, Member uh, from Richmond Hill to ask his question. I'm going to give the Honourable Member from Richmond Hill 15 seconds to finish his question. The Honourable Member. Last year, more than 230,000 Canadians were forced out of their home not knowing what the future holds. Now, next to 100 fires are already burning in British Columbia, and communities are rightfully concerned. Can the Minister of Emergency Preparedness tell us what our government has been doing to make sure we will be there for British Columbians this summer? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Richmond Centre for this very important and timely uh, question. Last year we had the worst wildfire season in Canadian history because of climate change and uh, potentially this season could be even worse. We have been working very closely with the province and territory and the Indigenous leaders to provide the resources that they need. We are training more firefighters, providing additional firefighting equipment and adding more initiatives to provide humanitarian support. On this side of the House, we know the devastating impact that climate change is having on Canadians and we will be there for them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Seniors are being kicked out of their homes because assisted living is now fodder for greedy developers and private equity firms. 90-year-olds are being put on the street so that super-rich CEOs can make a buck. Yep. The Liberals and the Conservatives let developers buy up affordable housing, and now they're letting them go after long-term care. A yep. family whose father was quick kicked out of his home called this a death sentence. Will the government stop this in its tracks and use the budget to end greedy CEOs from evicting vulnerable seniors? The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, as we move down a path of increasing investments to build more affordable housing, we have to acknowledge the very real challenge with, that exists when affordable housing that is already in communities is snapped up to be uh, for the purpose of renovicting those who live in it. That's why we're moving forward with a Canadian First, a new acquisition fund that's going to help 
nonprofits buy up existing low-cost rentals so they can keep them affordable in perpetuity. This is a new direction that's going to help many thousands of Canadians not just find a place to call home, but to keep a place to call home that they can actually afford. Honourable Member from North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, in the past two years, there's been a 50% increase in denied claims for veterans seeking disability benefits. This is shameful. They served our country, risking their lives and safety in the process. Yet the Liberals keep turning their backs on them, just like the Conservatives did for years before. This is an issue of respect and livelihood. Many veterans are struggling and they rely on these benefits to make ends meet. Do the Liberals plan on fixing this or will they keep denying veterans their dignity? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister for Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to thank my colleague for important work on the Veterans Affairs Committee. Mr. Speaker, our government has always been there for veterans and will continue to be there. Since 2015, we've invested more than $11 billion in additional funding to support veterans and their families. We've also, in contrast to the Conservative Party of Canada, when they closed the Veterans Affairs Office, on this side of the House, we opened them immediately because we recognize that they provided direct services to victims, uh, to, to veterans. Mr. Speaker, we will always be there to help support our veterans in their time of need and their family. Thank you. And as such, it comes to an end of question period. But I would like to bring to the attention of honourable members, it's a great privilege for me to draw to the attention of honourable members in the presence of the gallery of Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak, National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Member from Abbotsford. As Mr. Speaker, during question period today, uh, the member for North Island Powell River directed a comment at us here in the back benches and directed at me as well. And uh, she used the term shut up. Now, she is a member that generally conducts herself in a very civil manner. But today, using the term shut up, is a manner unbecoming of a, prime, of a parliamentarian. And you know, Mr. Speaker, that it is, it is you who, in fact, ensures civility within this House. You are the one who corrects us when we use language that is unbecoming. She actually repeated the remark when I asked her, did you tell us to shut up? She said, yes, shut up. That is behavior unbecoming of a parliamentarian. So, Mr. Speaker, I would ask you to ask her to apologize for that remark and to withdraw it unconditionally. Thank you. I see the Honourable Member from North Island, North Island Powell River is rising. The Honourable Member. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, I thank the member for bringing up how disruptive the Conservatives continue to be in this House. And just to clarify the record, I actually didn't tell him to shut up the second time. I told him to shush. So I will not be withdrawing, and I hope their behaviour gets better. <laughs> I thank the Honourable Member from uh, Abbotsford for raising this issue. It was brought to my attention. I know that members, uh, we all could do a lot to improve uh, decorum in this House, and I hope that we all will. But this, this issue was raised by the Member of Abbotsford, and the Member from North Island Power River acknowledged uh, that she used uh, language which, which certainly 
uh, causes a disorder in the House. I would ask the Honourable Member from North Island Powell River if uh, she would do the honourable thing and withdraw that comment. No, Mr. Speaker, I certainly will not. I'm going to, before I move on with points of order, I'm going to just deal with this matter first. I'm, I'm going to ask. I, Again, the Honourable Member from North Island Powell River is a long-time member. We've served together uh, in this House on, on many committees. Um, I, out of respect to the Chair, I will ask her once again if she could please withdraw that remark. And I have served many years with you, Mr. Speaker, but my concern is very serious about the fact that members who are asking questions are silenced again and again by the Conservatives. So out of respect, I will not withdraw, and I don't mean that personally. So sad that the Conservatives have very sensitive feelings about it. <laughs> I'm afraid I. I'm afraid I, I have no choice but to uh, ask the member uh, because uh, to not follow through with a request from the chair, I'm going to have to ask the honourable member please to leave the chamber. I, I see that the honourable member from uh, Hamilton Centre is rising on a similar point of order. Mr. Speaker, on the question, I think it's important for us to reflect on what has transpired in this House. You'll recall that there was a member from Regina who absolutely insulted a member. Sir, you gave him his entire question back, and yet when the disruption of this backbench, some who don't have the privilege of asking questions in this House, decided to interrupt my question, I did not receive the opportunity to ask it in full. It is at that point when the intervention happened, Mr. Speaker. So if it is on the question of disruption, you should note, note the heckling that's happening right now. Note the disorder in this House right now, Mr. Speaker, and I encourage you to reflect on what you've just did to this member, this honourable member from our party, when these people continue to act completely out of order in this House. So let me, uh, let me, let me, let me, uh, Colleagues, colleagues, we're coming back to the point of why it is so important for us to conduct ourselves uh, with dignity in this place. Uh, the Honourable Member from Hamilton Centre has raised an important point, and I would like to point out to the Honourable Member that the Chair actually did hear his question up until a certain point, and then in not being able to hear the Honourable Member, as I had mentioned from the Chair, I gave the Honourable Member more time to finish his question. Uh, first of all, I sought order in the House and asked the Honourable Member to give him more time to finish his question to start further up. The Honourable Member from Regina Leuven, uh, uh, at the top end of his question, uh, used language which was un uh, complimentary, and I asked him to rephrase uh, his, his question, uh, which he did. Um, but, colleagues, you know, it, it is very difficult to sit in this chair and to have uh, members act in a way which is really not befitting to this place. Uh, and sometimes the chair uh, raises the issue uh, when the chair feels compelled that the chair has to do that. Sometimes members raise the issue. And when members raise the issue, that is a time that the chair has to uh, deal with it. And as a result, it was with great regret that I asked the member from North Island Powell River uh, uh, to, uh, to, to leave this place for the day, and uh, because it was at the request of the chair to ask for that comment to be withdrawn so that that disorder or order can be restored to the House as was raised by the member of Abbotsford. That's the only reason why that had happened. I ask all members to remind themselves that once again, the chair can only go with so far as members will permit the, uh, the chair to go. It requires members to act in a manner that is befitting of this place. I think we all can learn from this 
uh, from this situation. I see the honourable member from uh, the very experienced member from uh, New Westminster, Burnaby, rising in his place on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is not up to any individual member to try to get the respect in the House that the Conservatives consistently refuse to show. And so I would ask you to use the tools that you have available to you. We have granted you the ability to dock questions when the Conservatives are causing disorder, as they do so frequently, I would ask you to exercise the powers you have and dock their questions so that members like the member from North Island Power River are not forced to try to intervene to stop them from allowing us to ask questions in the House of Commons. Here, here. I thank the member from New West, Westminster, Burnaby, uh, for that intervention. And indeed, uh, the chair is uh, increasingly reaching that point uh, where, uh, with proper warning, uh, we'll uh, start probably moving down that way. I hope I don't have to. And I hope that members will be able to conduct themselves in a way that is, uh, that is befitting of this place. The Honourable Member from Leeds Grenville, uh, Leeds Grenville, Thousand Island and Rideau Lakes I see is rising, I'm assuming, on a similar point yeah, of order. Same, same point of order, Chair. Um, the uh, NDP House Leader, the uh, Member for Timmins, James Bay, uh, the Member for Hamilton, I can, we, we can check off everyone on the list. The members of the fourth party in the House create the same level of disorder as all members do in engaging in heckling, like is happening right now, but Speaker, uh, you know what? That, that's part of the, the customs that have been adopted by this place. And the matter at hand is that the Speaker made a ruling, and now in succession, we have NDP members standing up and chastising the Speaker for ruling the wrong way. That's not how it works in this place. Members of, members of the official opposition, when asked to withdraw, in spite of their uh, continuing to hold the convictions of what they've said, out of deference to the chair, have, have withdrawn and apologized. And when they have not done so at any point in history, they've been ejected, and that's how this place works. We don't have every member then stand up and challenge the chair's ruling because um, Frankly, that's, uh, that's unparliamentary and unbefitting any member who does it. So uh, order has been restored with the Chair's ruling. We thank you for that. I thank the member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Real Lakes for his intervention. But once again, and once again, not but, but and once again, I call on all members, because this happens, unfortunately, far too often. And it causes disorder. It is not something that I think uh, Canadians appreciate, and I don't think any member of Parliament who spent a lot of time and effort to represent their constituents uh, to come to this place to help uh, pass laws and make laws and to keep governments to account uh, wanted to participate in a place where, frankly, with behaviour that would not be accepted in any other workforce or workplace in this country. So I thank the honourable member. I hope that will serve as a purpose to encourage all members to conduct themselves in a better way. I see the honourable member from Winnipeg Centre standing on her feet uh, to raise the matter. And uh, again, uh, a very, uh, a very passionate and, and a very uh, a contributive member uh, from Parliament who is rising a point of order. And I hope it will add a new uh, um, dimension to this debate. The honourable member from Winnipeg Centre. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And we've had the occasion to speak about exactly what is going on. Uh, in the house. I have to say myself on Thursday of last week I felt that I behaved in a non-parliamentary way as well because it is un out of control on the conservative side of the bench constant toxic masculinity yes. including yes. Uh, harassing the member from Nunavut yes. which I found so offensive. Yes. What I find shocking Mr. Speaker with all due respect is that this is the first occasion where this kind of severe response has been taken. Yep. 
yet there is a normalization of gender-based violence being perpetrated by conservative members on that side that happens every single day in this house all day. Exactly. I thank the honourable member uh, from Winnipeg Centre. J'espère que le 